I'm Sarah Butcher. Welcome back to The Side Comment. We're joined today by Jonathan D. Cohen, author of For a Dollar and a Dream, State Lotteries in Modern America. Jonathan's book is the first comprehensive history of the American lottery industry, and it explores not only how, in a period of surging inequality, millions turn to the lottery to achieve the American dream, but also how policymakers have encouraged our habit. Today, Jonathan will introduce us to the history of the Daily Numbers, a game that was popular in Black American communities in the 60s and 70s that paved the way for some of the most successful state lotteries to date. Hi, my name is Jonathan Cohen. I'm a historian, uh, and I'm the author of For a Dollar and a Dream, State Lotteries in Modern America, uh, out earlier this year from Oxford University Press. And just to provide a little bit of context, lottery sales in, in modern America are much bigger than you probably imagine, uh, to the tune of about $94 billion last year. As recently as 2014, that's more than Americans spent on books, sports tickets, video games, music, and movie tickets combined, uh, with about one in eight Americans playing the lottery at least once a week and 50% doing so at least once a year. So I'm happy to share one story from my book that that I thought would be particularly poignant and particularly important, uh, which is the history of illegal numbers games in urban black communities and how those paved the way for the modern state lottery system in the 1960s. The story begins, I'm a historian by training, so uh, I'll start at the very beginning, but lotteries uh, date back in the earliest iteration as a form of uh, raising finance for state funds as early as the 15th century. Um, and they were used in, in Europe and in much of the United States to pay for infrastructure for projects uh, for states wary of taxation and for individuals wary of taxation. A lottery was a uh, easy alternative uh, way to raise money. Um, lotteries continued in this popularity uh, for much of the 19th and early 20th centuries, waxing and waning in terms of what was legal and what was illegal. Uh, but by the early 20th century, basically all lotteries uh, were illegal uh, in the United States, even uh, for, for purportedly good purposes. Um, then sometime around 1924, Casper Holstein, an immigrant from the Danish West Indies, uh, moved, to, moved to Harlem and invented what became known as numbers games. Uh, so for many years, African-American bettors, as well as white working class bettors, had played a game called policy, uh, which was if you couldn't afford a full lottery ticket, you'd take an insurance policy, it was called on the ticket. So you were betting on sort of a side piece of the action, whether certain numbers would come up or whether a certain, you'd buy a share of a ticket. Policy eventually became a game in, in its own right, a sort of a two to three uh, numbers based game. You'd get try to guess two numbers in a row between one and 78. And what Casper Holstein invented was what we now know as a numbers game, which is a three or four digit daily lottery game. And the the brilliance of what Holstein invented is that the game was designed in such a way that it couldn't possibly be rigged so that participants, so that gamblers, never needed to worry that the house was cheating them. And he did this by identifying a way for the number to be selected in a way that it could not be shaped by outside or, or nefarious forces. And that was for many years, the last three digits of the uh, New York Stock Exchange. So if the stock exchange was $1,312,000, those last three digits, three, 312, might be the day's number. And you could bet on it in a variety of forms, in a certain order, the first two numbers, the last two numbers. But needless to say, this was a huge improvement over the extremely corrupt iterations of numbers games that had existed before the 1920s and was an immediate hit, particularly in urban black communities in the Northeast and in the Rust Belt, uh, in places like Newark, in New York City, uh, in Chicago, where actually the policy, the earlier po policy iteration remained popular and in other cities as well. And so these these games were, were effectively ubiquitous. And before the w advent of the war on drugs, uh, th this is drawing from the work of historian Matthew Baz, the sort of primary means of police enforcement in black communities was through numbers games, in large part because basically everyone either played the game or worked for one, or at least so it seemed. And such that before the war on drugs, the sort of way that the police were able to arbitrarily arrest effectively urban African-Americans was through their participation in illegal gambling. 
And this is this is crucial because as the decades went along and the games became more uh, and more popular and more and more prevalent, they also were known outside of these urban black communities, particularly uh, to white suburbanites. And in the 1960s, the states began legalizing lotteries of their own, beginning in 1963 with the state of New Hampshire, uh, which does not have a lot of illegal gambling, but does have extremely low taxes and does to this day uh, that required the advent of a state lottery. New York, which borders New Hampshire, uh, followed in 1967. New Jersey followed in 1969. Um, and that sort of opened the floodgates, at least for the Northeast, for the, for the duration of the 1960s and 1970s. And one reason that lotteries were concentrated, especially in the Northeast and in states like Illinois and Michigan uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, was that these were the very same states where illegal uh, numbers gaming was so prevalent and so popular. And so by the 1960s, once New Hampshire sort of broke the mold and, and decided that it was going to bring back the lottery system, states began to reason that if gambling was happening anyway, if all these particularly urban African-Americans and, and Latinos and some white working class people were gambling anyway and were gambling illegally, then the state might as well legalize the games to make some of that money for itself. And this was, I will add by, by way of context, roughly around the time when, when rhetoric around victimless crimes was beginning to emerge. But that victimless crime rhetoric, which scholars tried to use to describe things like drug use and sex work, it just didn't catch on other vices in the way that it did for gambling. Gambling was the one area where the police enforcement had been so corrupt for so long that it was really just both white suburbanites and urban African-Americans who participated in the games reasoned that no amount of enforcement was gonna solve the problem and get rid of illegal gambling. So states may as well legalize for themselves. And, and an important parallel here is the prohibition of alcohol from the 1920s. And the lesson that many took away from prohibition or the aftermath of prohibition was that the state had tried to repress a popular vice, but had utterly failed because no amount of police enforcement can stop people who want to take a drink. And similarly applying to the 1960s, it seemed that no amount of police enforcement could stop this seemingly irrefutable uh, urge, irrepressible urge to gamble both among urban communities and even out in the suburbs. So that helped set the stage for gambling legalization. And then the other major factor, I think, that, that turned states on to illegal gambling as a source of revenue was, ironically, all the investigations into illegal gambling that had occurred in the 1950s and the 1960s, beginning with the Estes Kefauver hearings in the 1950s into organized crime, uh, and then going on into the 1960s when the Johnson and Nixon administrations launched their own wars on crime. Um, and it's often overlooked, but very important dimension of that war on crime that they launched was targeting of illegal gambling and specifically organized crime. But as a result of all these investigations, it was widely known beyond just newspaper headlines about numbers operators and lottery players who had been arrested. It was widely known how much money there was for the taking in the gambling sphere. And so all of this sets the stage for state referendums in the late 1960s and early 1970s when Northeastern and Rust Belt states um, decide if they're going to enact lotteries for themselves. And the answer uniformly is yes. In New Jersey, which is the case study uh, subject of the first chapter of my book, uh, the 1969 state lottery referendum is the first referendum in state history to pass by over one million votes. And the reason uh, it is so popular, white suburbanites, again, reason that all this gambling is happening anyway, and the state may as well profit from it rather than benefiting organized crime. And second, it finds even more overwhelming support in places like Newark and Trenton, uh, urban predominantly minority communities where the numbers games have been basically an excuse for police to arbitrarily harass people and where community members hoped the lottery uh, run by a state might hand over some of the profits and some of the operations to the actual communities themselves uh, to allow them to build wealth. So lotteries, again, sort of spread with this strange coalition of white suburbanites and urban non-white uh, voters in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, the result, though, is actually very similar to what is currently happening uh, in the debates over uh, marijuana legalization, where there is a seemingly irrepressible vice 
one that is quote unquote happening anyway, and that the state quote might as well make money off of, and that is being legalized, but is being legalized in such a way that it cuts out those who had been part of the illegal trade. So just as uh, in today's in today's market, anyone with a former um, with a conviction related to drug dealing might be cut out of the legal marijuana trade. So too did the state uh, enactment of lottery games cut out many, many, many people who had convictions related to illegal gambling on their record. And this was particularly notable for thousands and, and thousands of young men. Uh, young black men in particular, who were numbers runners, who would take bets on the street and bring money back to to game operators who were at the front lines of this police harassment and police uh, arrest and had convictions on the record that made them ineligible, not just to work in the legal gambling industry, but at the time legal to work in almost any private industry whatsoever. And this is this is particularly important because initially state lotteries don't compete with numbers games. Uh, initially, the games they they offer are boring, are slow, the tickets are expensive, but over time states wise up and they add their own daily numbers games. They can offer better odds, they can offer safer payouts, they can offer uh, a that the IRS isn't going to come after you because the state can, can handle the taxes with you. And gradually, by the 1980s, illegal numbers players shift to, to state-owned games and cut the illegal lottery market basically uh, out at the knees. So there are still some rumors uh, of persistent illegal numbers games for those who don't want uh, the state involved in their gambling. But for the most part, numbers games remain popular, uh, mostly in the same states where they those games existed in the 1960s and 1970s. And mostly among the same communities of urban African Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, and and white working class players. It is not a huge percentage of lottery revenue. Uh, last I checked, around maybe ten to fifteen percent. But it is a consistent money maker uh, for states, one that they would be loath to give up. So this is again a, an example um, of the sort of the deep history uh, of the lotteries uh, in America today. What we've come to accept as a normal part of the American commercial landscape, uh, but one with with deep ties uh, into the nation's cultural and social and economic and racial histories. And in, in particularly in this case, the history of how these illegal games through a series of surprising twists and turns paved the way for the modern lottery industry. Thanks for listening.